As you know, uh, New England Biolabs has been a supporter of uh, science and continues to be for its entire history. And as part of that, obviously, is a great supporter of scientific education. And all the awardees in this category definitely uh, also achieve that. They're devoting endless time and uh, energy, and in some cases, I heard last night, have become more famous for their outside activities <coughs> in this regard than they have actually the research activities, as they devote this time to actually help generate the next uh, generation of scientists. And our first uh, awardee definitely falls into that category. I'm going to keep the slides going. And that is uh, Stephen Farber. Uh, Stephen is actually a researcher out of the uh, Carnegie Institute of Science, uh, which if you're not familiar with, is uh, associated with uh, Johns Hopkins in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, when he actually met uh, Garfield, who he sat uh, next to, he said, oh, I'm another fish guy. So uh, that uh, sort of sums up his research. But that sort of fish expertise has also gone into his uh, other part of his life, which is the founding of a non-profit organization called BioEyes, uh, which is actually using zebrafish, or uh, I was trying to work out whether zebrafish or zebrafish in, uh, in my case, but uh, I'll say both to uh, capture both uh, sides of the Atlantic. But he's actually been using that uh, organism to actually excite and uh, educate uh, K through 12 uh, students about science, how they should think about science, and what scientists actually do. And uh, I understand there's now been over 125,000 uh, students worldwide actually involved in the program, which is a phenomenal success. So I'd like to invite uh, Stephen up to uh, give his presentation. I think we've got to switch uh, uh, slide projectors. Uh, projectors quickly. Wow, it's uh, really uh, an incredible honor to be here to talk to you about um, BioEyes and uh, my experience. And what I'll do is try to use the time uh, I have to give you a feel for like, you know, how this all got started and maybe reflect a little bit on the little choices we make because nobody wakes up in the morning and says, you know what, I'm going to design a program to reach 100,000 kids. Um, it's a bunch of little choices and maybe my story will inspire you to, to think that some of the little choices you make could end up in places you never imagined. So. Um, I'll start out like this was a slide I made when I was a postdoc. Uh, I, I actually postdoc at the Carnegie Institution, learned the fish system, and then started my lab in Philadelphia in the Kimmel Cancer Center in Thomas Jefferson University. And after Andy Fire won the Nobel Prize and he went back to, uh, he went and moved to um, Stanford, it was, uh, there was an opening and uh, I loved being at the Carnegie so much, I, I um, applied and came back. So this was a fish tank at Carnegie, and when I started my talks back then, I would always say, like, why fish? And if you think of these little larvae, they're like little petri dishes, little dishes of bacteria. They're 25 micrograms of protein. Each mom will lay 300 to 500 embryos once a week. They have this little chorion around them, but you could see right through them. You can even take the chorion off if you're careful with the tweezers, and they don't see, they'll develop just fine. The key thing is development is insanely rapid. You know, you go from one cell to a beating heart in like 2.5 days, right? And they're about seven millimeters and every single cell you could see. So of course, developmental biologists went crazy over the system. Most of the field is thinking about how do I go from one cell to a critter? Awesome question. Actually, that's not what my lab does, which is uses them for physiology and biochemistry. We basically use the optical clarity to do, uh, use fluorescent and optical reporters that change colors to visualize digestive processes in the gut. So we feed glow-in-the-dark lipids. Here's a, lip, a molecule that is quenched, and when a lipase cuts off the acyl chain, it then fluoresces, and then we could look at single cell at like 63x under a confocal and look at intestinal absorption of fatty acid molecules into these enterocytes. And one of um, my most highly cited papers involves showing that microbiota regulate the absorption of these molecules and, and really gets us into the whole understanding more about what's going on in our gut. But all these features that make the zebrafish awesome in the lab is what makes them amazing in a classroom. Because Scientists like me, we're not marine biologists. So like I say it all the time, like we just use the darn fish. And so when the community picked this, and there was a little fight between the Madaka and the zebrafish, it had to be like 
really easy to use them in the lab, easy to grow, really robust. You know, all these features have to be in this organism. And that's how the community picked the fish to be the vertebrate fish system. So how did this whole thing of BioEyes get started? Well, for those of you with kids, most of us with kids end up in your kid's classroom, right? So you bring in, you chuck in your stuff for the day, you show your kid's classroom. And teachers are going to be like, wow, you know, this fish thing is cool. And they might ask us to do that again, and we might do it a couple times, but it's hard to sustain that, you know? And secondly, there's this thing called the bug lady phenomena. Like when I was in my son's class, I remember volunteering one time, and this woman came in with this like wooden chest with all these compartments and had all these insects in it. And the kids go wild, you know, looking at the insects. But then the, I overheard the teacher comment to someone, oh, I, I just kind of lost a day because the way education is now, it's so focused on curriculum objectives that if you don't align with the objectives, um, it's not just good so that the kids have fun. These teachers are, 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 are being evaluated. And so that's another piece that got in my mind. So this whole thing started after they built my lab. In, um, and I started in 2000. Um, somebody was doing a take your child to work day. And since it's a Thomas Jefferson University in Center City, there's a big city hospital. You're not going to have kids roaming around the building all the time. So they brought all, if you brought your kid to work, it was like an organized activity with a bus that took them around and they walked around, they had lunch, and somebody thought, well, we'll just bring them to Farber's Lab. It's like, you know, the aquarium. You know, they had just spent all this money to build me a 14 rack fish facility. So they bring the kids in, and I had seen, this is another point, I'd seen my mentor, Marnie Halpern, had done some of these show and tells for kids. And so I knew to set up stations. So I had stations in the lab, and the kids come in, and they see the development at different stages. And they came in the lab, they looked at the fish, and, and then they left. Now, the one thing that happened was, like anything these days, including maybe you know when you deal with anybody on the phone or whatever, you get an evaluation. So somebody did an evaluation at the end, and guess whose visit was the most popular visit? It was. Farber's lab. And that came, this was the letter in 2002 talking about the take your child to work day and that it was an overwhelming success. So the first rule I learned at any major organization is if you do something well, there's only one thing that's going to happen. You're going to be asked to do that thing over and over and over again. And then you'll get expanded on that thing. So next thing you know, I have the nurses after school YMCA bridge club, br bridge program for minority kids coming into my lab. I'm having all these programs coming in the lab. The dean's uh, enrichment program. So my lab is starting to complain. They're like, Steve, you know, this is tough, you know? and. Um, my wife, who's a social psychologist, PhD academic, she was like, Steve, you got to, if, if Jefferson wants you to do this so much, they should give you some money and a person. So she put the seed in my mind. So then this is where the coconut trip and the wine come in. You know, you never get the grad student out of the PI. So I come walk into my building in jeans, maybe even ripped, and there was this, um, there was this, um, uh, there was this display out with wine and shrimp. And even though it was for the surgeons, you know, when you're PI, you think, ah, oh, you know, I'm, I'm entitled. So I, they weren't there yet. So I go up, I grab the wine, I grab the shrimp, and I turn around, and it's the dean of medicine, right in my face. <laughs> so all I could say was, like, you're the dean, right? And he goes, you're a farmer. You just got this Pew Award. That helped, because I got selected as a Pew Scholar. And I said, yeah. And then my wife's comment, I said, he goes, I, I sponsored this after school program and the kids love the fish. And then I made my first ask. I just said, well, you know, if you could provide me some funds to hire somebody, um, I think I could do this a lot more effectively. And I remember, like, he was completely unexpecting that, you know? Mm -hmm. Jefferson was under a lot of physical, uh, f uh, financial stress at the time, but the guy said yes. He, he paused. And um, this was Tom Nasca, and he, he said, well, look, I can, and this was another thing I learned. He said, I can't give you a whole salary. I probably could come up with like 40K, because you got salary and benefits, 30K. Go to all the other deans. Do not use my name. And say, I have an unnamed dean who'll come up with most of the money, but you got to come up with some more money. So I did that, got the money, and fortunately hired a Jamie. 
And I had found, like, and how did I find Jamie? Like a typical, you know, most of us, we don't go search the whole space for the most qualified. My a student was rotating my lab whose brother was dating this woman who got a master's in science education. <laughs> so I did put out an ad and got like two other people. And I, I had the idea to interview her with my son, who was eight. And literally, because I knew that this person needed to be a real teacher. And Jamie was an elementary school teacher. And the other two people, although qualified, hadn't had that much experience. So when Jamie walked in the room, she treated <coughs> Elias like a little person, like the way te teachers do, and engaged with him immediately. And when I, she left and everyone left, I said, well, Elias, who do you think we should pick? He's like, Jamie, of course. I can't believe Dad you'd even think about that. So. Um, this was amazing. So it's all because this is, I didn't know how to run a classroom. When I went in my son's class, I like lined all the kids up behind the microscope and they're like punching each other and everything. Like Jamie knew you had to have work stations and a plan and all the ways that teachers work. So what made this work was recognizing I might know a lot about science or my little area and I might want to make a difference, but I was never trained in what it takes to run a classroom. And that's the first lesson, I, the humbling lesson, that working together made this, was one of the secret sauce, if you will, of the program. So um, our mission is to excite kids about science to, in biology rated fields, through hands-on experience. Because I wanted student kids to feel like what I felt uh, you know, when I come in the lab in the morning. Like, I, I don't want them to like read stuff on a book or learn about scientists. I want them to do science, right? So that was an underlying thing for me. And um, I'm going to play, I have a couple little movies to kind of um, give you a feel for it, because I think the movies are a lot better than me talking about it. I never would have imagined that a program started in my lab in 2002 would reach 100,000 kids all around the world. Project BioEyes is designed to excite K through 12 children about science and about careers in science and give them a feel for what it's like to be a scientist. All right, what were those directions called and how to make them? What did they say? DNA. DNA, very good. We're reaching 3,000 kids every year in Baltimore City. These kids really don't get the opportunity that children from communities with more resources get. What's another difference between the zebrafish and the humans? We don't become a larva, that's right. Through BioEyes, kids learn the intellectual concepts. They improve usually on every question by substantial amounts. Make sure you look very carefully. You see them? Everybody see them? They are. The kids set up the fish to mate them. All right, you got the female. She's going to go back to tank A. Collect embryos, and then they do observations of those embryos. 47, 48, 49. And it culminates where they study the circulatory system and actually see the heart beating. But when you plunk some fish on the desk, those kids will focus intensely. They like to watch the animals, observe the animals, and care for them. What we've also learned is that these children can imagine themselves as a scientist. I want to be a scientist because I can make robot parts for old people. You can help people. Did the fish teach you something about science? Yep. Did this make you want to be a scientist? Yep. So the key pillars of this effort is it's got to be it's got to be a teacher professional development effort because when you change a teacher, you change all the kids that that teacher interacts with for their whole life. See, I didn't know that at the beginning. I thought it was about the kids. It took me a couple years to figure out it was actually about the teachers. Cool content, and the other thing that makes it really tough and expensive is you gotta co-teach. You can't send a teacher to professional development, expect them to feel confident handling a live animal. Most early childhood education teachers still are mostly female 
And still the stereotype is they chose that profession precisely because they felt they weren't good in science. That's changed a lot in obviously high school. But early childhood educators, are that stereotype, that uncomfortableness with science is still uh, largely present. And these are the folks that we're sending our kids to learn science from at the earliest ages. So they really need our help. So you know what I say to them with my heart is when they come to teacher training on the weekend, I go, you know, we're trying in my lab to do new science. It's not on Wikipedia. It's nowhere on the internet. And we want the brightest, smartest, most diverse people to come to, I want them to come to my lab. And before they're in my lab, they're in your class. So I am like so thankful that you are coming to work with us together. That's what I tell my colleagues. We can't just sit back and expect the, the kids to have a passion for these and these uh, to, be pa to understand science. And so that's basically the model. This is from our PLOS biology paper in 2016. We use the scientific method on ourselves, you know, but we did experiments. We've come up with a program where we have a scientist like me. It's all over the world and it's decentralized, but it needs a scientist who's a zebrafish researcher. It needs teachers. It needs school districts. And it needs to be always linked to the curriculum for that region of the country, that part of the world. Like, what do they want the kids to learn? Um, so, you know, in little kids, it's about life cycles and habitats. When you start getting into middle school, it's just perfect for talking about uh, genetics. And you ask, like, what happens if you put a male or female wild type with the male or female pigment? Uh, a, a mutation in a pigment gene, what are the babies going to look like? And you know, we have these uh, really interesting, engaging little uh, lab journals for them to work on through the week that we kind of, a marketing team helped us with. Like, that's another thing, you know, as a scientist, we have maybe a negative, I had a negative stereotype about marketing, I'll be honest about that. <laughs> um, but, um, but what I learned there was like, we found this group that had done a lot of work for the Philadelphia Eagles. And we came up with a little bit of money, but they did so much work for free with the storyboards and concepts. And I learned a lot about that, that they were so happy to be doing BioEyes with us. So early on, they helped us create some of these concepts that we built upon. So I really got a lot of respect for that, and I think that helped. Um, in making the materials really useful. And then I'll tell you like some of the topics, right? So in middle school, you have male, fe you know, word choice, the vocabulary might be male, female, sperm, egg, embryo, DNA, petri dish, microscope. Well, we're talking about reproduction, right? We're talking about sex. And in the US, that's, by the way, that's completely age appropriate. Girls are getting their periods, right? But in some parts of the country, we are so wacky. We cannot talk about this topic, right? But the thing about fish, they just swim by each other, and there's no mechanical issue to discuss. So <laughs> then no one gets upset. I, I purposely showed you a parochial school for that reason, right? We've had Catholic schools. That, there was one case where the educators didn't tell me because I would have gotten upset that one upset, one principal didn't want them to use the word sperm. They used special cell. They were okay with egg. They were not okay with sperm. And parents came to the class. Now, they didn't tell me because I probably <laughs> would have gone ballistic over that or whatever. But um, it worked out. Okay, it worked out. So I think that's, it's, it's a bizarre, quirky aspect of the United States, I think. But, um, you know, and kids, they know in middle school, they, they are always applying human stuff. Like they'll say, um, you know, do the fish have to kiss for the sperm to come out? Or what about you? They'll start talking about humans, you know? And we'll go, you know what? We're working on fish today, but that's a great question for your parents, you know? <laughs> so, um, so that always works out, right? And we've been doing this all over. So, but, but if you think about it, that's what is great about this system. You, the first experiment they do is who's a male and who's a female? And kids, I love always turning the tables on kids because you'll see in one kid, I have a little clip, 
they always think the male is the female. Because when you look in the tank, that female looks so respectable and the male looks so wimpy. In fact, we put the tree in there because she'll whack him and he'll, he'll come in and he'll be dead, right? So the tree is so that the little male can hide from her. So, um, uh, but, the, but the girls will almost always say the bigger fish is the male, right? And without saying any lecture or anything, they learn, oh, the female is the bigger fish. She has eggs, right? And they also do things like they say, oh, my female doesn't like my male because she's running away. But then you teach about selection. You say, well, it's more like chase. How do you, what kind of skills do you need to play chase in the playground? You have to be able to fast. You have to see. You have to do all. So suppose your male is really sick. Right? Are you going to want to waste your eggs for that sick male? And so we, there's a discussion about selection. Again, they don't think that the female is evaluating the male. So there's so many fun topics that are organic with just looking at the, like kids all over the world say some of the same things because these stereotypes are so prevalent. But it's, you know, so there's a lot of fun with that. Um, the other thing I'll mention is, for those of you who don't know about this story, this is a wild type fish. And this is a golden fish. And as you can tell, they're the same species and all. It's a different uh, mutant line. And a colleague of mine, uh, Keith Chang at University of Pennsylvania, at um, Penn State, he set out to clone what's different between golden and wild type. So he clones a gene. Um, and one of the things we've learned, as most of you here appreciate, is it was really amazing when they sequenced all these genomes and saw how similar the zebrafish genome and the human genome, in fact, all the genomes actually are, much more similar than we imagined. Because we always thought, you know, humans were the big cheese. We're going to have more genes. We're going to, you know, and it was, you know, once we realized fish had twice as more genes, it wasn't going to be about that. So this is just an example of the chromosome structure. You know, you'll see whole centenic clusters. So anyway, they clone this gene in the golden fish. And you, you go on the internet, instantly comes up, SL24A5. What's that mean? Nobody really, it wasn't really explored before. And um, so this is a part of the high school curriculum. And we talk about what the, pre, the, the central dogma, DNA to protein. And from that paper, you can align the sequence of this gene. And you notice there's this T here, right? Now guess what? This was a white dude. What do you all think an African has there? Exactly, an A, which means that uh, white people are mutants, right? The natural color is dark. And this single gene turns out to explain the largest fraction of human skin color. And it was cloned from that fish from golden. And I think that kids come into the class with a concept of race. This is a social construction. But they leave the class with realizing this gene has been hit so many times independently on, in evolution to change and adjust pigmentation. And it's one amino acid. And it only really reflects where your ancestry came in reference to the equator. So I think that's a very different concept that most kids have before they do um, the unit. So in a way, we didn't like plan it, but it's just who, we, what better situation? We can deal with sex. We can deal with race. And then in this climate where you can't kill things, you know, when I went to high school, my teacher snapped the neck of a frog, jabbed a poker into the nervous system. It's called pithing. And you did this thing on a leg. Somebody's shaking their head. You cannot pith the frog in a classroom anymore, right? But with the fish, you can look at them and they can adopt the embryos. You know, we don't talk a lot how they, they well, they, the kids do face the fact that the parents eat the babies. And that's often a big topic of discussion. <laughs> but um, it, it's at least not a mammal, right? <laughs> so a key thing that I think we do as scientists is we published very early plus when they uh, highlighted us in the community page. Um, it, it was a huge gift to get a notice and a New York Times article, because that really helped when you're calling up companies like NEB or other places. You say, hey, just Google Steve Farber Zebrafish. You'll get the New York Times link. And it, was, it gives you that ability to legitimacy. So that was a, a huge help um, to raise this, the popularity of the program. 
And then we capped off uh, the analyzing after the 100,000th kid, we published all of our data on it. And I'll just, I'll show you a tiny bit of that. But in Baltimore, in a year, each year we reach about 3,500, 3,400 kids, 53 teachers from 46 schools. But every, there's sites all over the place in Utah, in Melbourne, Australia. Um, we do do assessments and kids, we measure what they learn pre and post and there are big differences. This is a sum of all the questions data. I'm not going to take you through the detailed questions. And we ask uh, questions like science is interesting. Sometimes we played around with the question men are better at science than women on a Likert scale. What's amazing is the little kids are like, what? Because strongly disagree is one and the little kids will say like two. They're really puzzled by that question. Mm -hmm. we, we, and then, but as you get to high school, it does move that people agree with that still more. But it just shows those fourth grade kids are so open to everything, you know? They actually have a pretty, in fifth grade, in fifth grade, science is interesting, has a score of 4.2. So these Likert scales are one is strongly disagree, five is strongly agree. So even before we do anything in the classroom, Kids are already into science. So this idea our young kids are not into science is completely wrong. They think science is really cool. So let me um, give you a little taste of some other just short snippets before I wrap up. My hypothesis was that the female fish would be, I mean the male fish would be, be bigger than the female fish because humans, the male, sometimes bigger than the female. But the conclusion was females were bigger because they had to lay eggs, so they had a lot of eggs. Oh. Last night I was talking to my dad about how they, oh, how they eat their uh, babies. I don't think that's good, that's being a good parent because you just eating your babies. That ain't right. <laughs> <laughs> Eating your babies is a big point of discussion, <laughs> right? Um, that captivates, because we bring in other modalities, art and writing. So when you ask them to write a little essay from the perspective of the fish, they always talk about, I was really worried my parents were going to eat me. <laughs> uh, so so uh, it's very common. After the embryos were collected, the students began to monitor their growth through a microscope. That growth was then recorded in their lab journals for them to make hypotheses and draw conclusions, much like professional scientists. We got to look under a microscope and look at how fish were growing. I've never been able to look at that before. Today we were looking at the heartbeat and that looked really cool because it's like you can see all the blood flowing through them, like their veins and all. I never really worked with animals as I did this week, so it was kind of interesting to do, try something new. This program not only explores the excitement of science, but also other aspects, like meticulous data collection and the mistakes that occur. The graphs were to show like how your data pro progressed over the week, so um, we no noted how many um, embryo we had. Um, the first, we had a lot, like our group had 330 embryos, and then we accidentally put them on the heating pad. In science, mistakes happen, and so we put them in the container that they're supposed to be on top of in the heating pad, and most of them got overheated and died. And like you can tell that they're dead because on the chart that we had earlier, there's a black side, and if you put it on the black side, they look like white little crystal-like things. That. Um, I share that all, all the time, and scientists like, this is our life, right? <laughs> this is our life. Metaphorically, where most experiments fail. And to get teachers to give that freedom and ambiguity to have that happen. Now, we don't use the word mistakes, per se, but that teacher did. But there's a good teacher behind that story, right? She was saying, like, so if th some teachers want to show PowerPoints of how to do everything and what the outcome should be, and we constantly say, that is not the point. It's purposely ambiguous. We may know, and not, we've done this enough time that we do sort of know the results, right? But these kids don't. And what that girl and her partner did was we had, like, we have a heating pad with a little sensor. Everything's real cheap. So it's a little amphibium heating pad with it, a row of empty tanks. And then you put your embryos on top of the empty tanks so that the, as the heating pad turns off on and off, the temperature flux is not 
hitting the embryos hard. So these girls thought, we're going to take make ours extra special. We'll lift the lid and put it right at the bottom, which put it right up against the heat plate. So of course, these embryos are getting heat shocked every 15 <laughs> minutes, right? But, but I think what it shows is that's giving them the experience of what it is to be a scientist, that we are affect, that's what we do every day. And you know, if you're not used to failure, you're not used to being a scientist. You know? um, Here's some of the things that kids say. Like, you have to be careful with those science, these science tools, because you can make things bad. <laughs> Not everything does turn out all the time like you think it's going to, and you need to be careful at everything. You must not be afraid of being wrong. Explore. That's a profound one, right? Um, you know, I get letters. Now, in fairness, because I have to run my lab, and, and it's pretty demanding being a scientist, as you all know, in these days. I go to classes like once a year to twice a year just to make sure the educators are saying scientifically correct things. And sometimes you go and you're like, uh, I don't know about that. But, but you know, so I do go and I happen to go this time. Uh, dear Dr. Farber, thank you for your time. It was fun learning about zebrafish with you and Krista. I hope you and Krista can come back to Russell Knight sometime to visit. That's their school. I also hope you and Krista can discover lots more. Hope being a scientist is not boring because I want to be one. Sincerely, Margaret. <laughs> and, and she's got zebrafish and microscope and I love fish and I guess that's me and Krista and that's a pipette. So. Um, <laughs> Um, this one, I mean, we, I should show some more boy letters, but you talk about sexual dimorphism. Oh my gosh, you look at letters from boys and girls, at least in gender. I haven't, you know, these days I haven't looked at when gender differences really arise, but there is some really amazing differences in writing. Thank you so much, very much, for one of the best weeks of my life. It was so exciting watching the fish develop during this week. One of my favorite things that we did was use the microscope and using the pipette. I'm so glad that now I have some kind of knowledge of fish and zebrafish, like how useful they are to science. You've inspired me to maybe be a scientist when I am older. <laughs> Thanks again, Elizabeth Dota. I, I, I took out one, one of my favorites is I think it was like, uh, this is, um, this is, this is Antonio, and I just wanted you to know, this is great, and can you have the program for my brother? You know, it's like, it was a totally, boy, and the writing was not as good as this. It was, it was you know, and uh, so anyway. I want to end with this letter because this was back in 2003 with Jamie, and I think it points to the challenges we face in public education. Dear Ms. Sharp, I just wanted to thank you for coming to our class. I think you thought we were the worst class we ever had. <laughs> All the teachers say that. Thank you for telling us your microscope, petri dish, pigment, and embryos. No one has ever worked with our class for a whole week, and we were happy that someone was you. Sincerely, junior class, junior scientist, Dasha. And I mean, you ask yourself, what, you know, what, what, there's so much in that letter about what messages these kids are getting. And this is like fourth grade. I mean, fourth grade, you know, and we're already the worst class. And, and so I think it, it's tough on educators to go into this space because you have amazing teachers and you have teachers that shouldn't be teaching. But the way I look at it, we are not going to solve education with just bio eyes. But there are those diamonds in the rough, you know? And we have a program in every city. We hook up with the, the public programs, the test-in schools in Baltimore. We have Baltimore Polytech, which is like Bronx School of Science. It's amazing school and the kids, so that kid that says I want to be a scientist when I grow up, you make sure those parents get the forms to make sure they apply to the programs that the city has to offer. So I think one thing I'll say that happened to me was I went, I, I'm also uh, on the board for um, uh, uh, an accelerated gifted program in Baltimore Polytech. And these kids are the best that Baltimore has, diverse, income diverse, racially diverse. And they do research in high school, like at Hopkins, or they work at companies, and they get recruited from all the best schools. They go to Berkeley and Oxford and everything. And one of the, but at the end of the year, they have a symposium, and the kids present their work, like a scientific symposium. And I was in the audience, you know, and I'm sitting there. And this one first generation uh, woman whose parents came from Africa, she was talking about sudden infant death. And she was doing a lot of sequencing of the actual genes that link to sudden infant death. And um, she was going to, got a full scholarship to WashU. 
and um, someone in the audience said, hey, you know, what got you interested in science? And she said, well, when I was in fifth grade, this program BioEyes came to my class. And I was just like sitting there like, wow, you know, we've been around enough that this actually happens. And some of my funders were in the audience. And I was like, see, you know, uh, you know, some of the foundations. And so, I mean, it's hard to do a scientific study to measure that. We actually are trying. But, um, but it, it, it's definitely something that um, I'm, I'm super proud of. And I think, like, some of my mentors said, hey, Steve, you're not going to get tenure. Don't get distracted. Everyone will see you not focused. This is a good thing, but you could, be, you could run into trouble. I got a lot of negative messages. But I, I also had mentors that didn't say that. And bringing it back around, it wasn't like it was just those little steps. It was the ask of the dean. It was pushing a little further. And then it just grew and grew and grew. So I just say to myself, I um, just feel lucky that I followed through with this and, and have this out there for all these kids to enjoy. And I just acknowledge, um, of course, I wouldn't be able to do it if I wasn't also doing stuff in my lab and had a lot of support for that effort. Jamie has my been co-creator and partner in this whole effort. And she's at University of Pennsylvania as the director of community outreach there. And the team in Baltimore is Valerie, Tyrone, and Rob. And um, it, it also, every institution I've been with has been super supportive, from Thomas Jefferson University to Carnegie Institution, folks at Penn. So uh, I'm glad to answer any of your questions, and thanks. Thanks, Justin. <laughs> We're a little bit over time, but uh, there's one brief question. Ben. Like you, you want to make sure you're instilling the next generation of scientists to be in your lab and advance your research. We have similar interests here, you know, we need to be advancing science as well. Um, what role, if any, do you see suppliers playing in making your efforts more significant? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question because there's bioized efforts and teachers from all over the country who want to support. And I think in your community, there should be a bioized effort. And that corporations do support in our long list. I didn't put up all of, it's so hard to put up a list of all the companies, but I think biotech, it would be amazing to have that co co partnership um, with um, schools. So I think, uh, I think we, uh, whether it's not, whether it's the NIH, whether it's, you know, we all have to band together to up the competencies because it's just so needed. <laughs>